2022 wasn't the most exciting year in video game history with the industry still feeling delays from the shutdown, but there were still some excellent titles last year. When the Game Awards came around and they were going to hand out their coveted Game of the Year, most people were really only discussing two games, God of War Ragnarok and Elden Ring. We know Elden Ring ultimately took home the trophy, but there's still some debate as to how the excellent story of God of War Ragnarok lost to open world Dark Souls. While having platinumed both games, I have the authority to tell you why FromSoft's magnum opus was easily crowned Game of the Year. For me, a platinum trophy is a really big compliment. I don't normally chase those, but whenever I do go for a 100% completion on a game, it's just because I love the game so much I don't want to quit. So I seek out the additional extra content just so I can spend extra time in that world. Now, both of these games were outstanding, but only one of them innovated in almost every aspect over previous titles. Let's look at God of War first, because it really is an excellent game that caps a very emotional saga. It speaks to just how great Elden Ring really is that it beat a game like this for the award. I don't know if it's gonna come across on the mic, but I'm feeling a little under the weather. This is, might be my only chance to do this. So, um, <clears throat> boy, that's the best I got. There cannot be enough praise for the story in this game, and it really should serve as an example when people are discussing the merits of video games in terms of storytelling. It's very moving in parts. It's inspirational. It explores complex themes like grief, regret, parental love, and especially delves into the idea that most of life is kind of a moral gray area, and we really only get to make value judgments with the clarity of hindsight. It's a wholesome journey and a thought-provoking one as well. Building on the themes of God of War 2018, Ragnarok expands its scope to tell the stories of all the characters involved instead of only focusing on the titular Kratos and his son Atreus. So yeah, the story was a big level up from the previous game, which itself was a big level up from the storytelling of the original series. In a previous video, I was talking about the great storytelling of video games and I was using Ragnarok as an example and I kind of waved off the story from the original games. Some people didn't like that, but I stand by that assessment. Look, don't get me wrong. Those games are very fun to play, got good gameplay, got a fun story to follow along. There is a story, but let's not pretend that they are anywhere near the level of the latest two games in terms of storytelling or theme. Revenge is always a lesser theme than love period. It's why people love The Last of Us Part 1 better than its sequel, and it's why the new God of War games are better than their predecessors. In the original games, Kratos is tricked by God of War Ares and then revenges on him. Then he wonders, did I revenge too hard? And he is sad. Was it worth it? Then he seeks to revenge harder in God of War 2, the revengening. Then he wonders again, did I revenge too hard? And again is sad. Rinse, repeat. Still, very fun games, but not a terribly interesting or deep theme. Also, side note, if you're ever extolling the virtues of storytelling in video games to someone, I would avoid using a title as an example that has you physically gouging somebody's eyes out with your thumbs on the thumbsticks in like the first half hour of the game, and I would also avoid games that involve you playing sex minigame quick time events. So, in 2018, Santa Monica Studios really stepped up the storytelling and the cinematic quality of this series. What they didn't update very much was the gameplay itself. For a story with such mature themes and gorgeous scenery to soak up, some of the more gamey aspects feel a little out of place and sometimes kind of immersion breaking. Kratos is wielding a set of infernal blades that were forged in Tartarus and bonded to him by the Greek god Ares. Why then in the Norse realms am I finding old sarcophagi that contain upgrades for these specific weapons. I mean, we were making fun of this crap 10 years ago when Laura Croft was raiding tombs that had supposedly been dormant for centuries and she comes across a wooden crate containing a machine gun upgrade. Huh? Look, I know it sounds nitpicky, but the series has been sticking to the formula of random treasure chests all over the place that you ransack. Even though Ragnarok doesn't have red orbs flying at your body from your defeated enemies, it still just feels too much like a video game, and it's incongruous with the story and theme. Sometimes they would even hang the lampshade like, you're trying to escape a hostile elven fortress, but you know there's a treasure nearby because there just so happens to be a crystal formation that your axe bounces off of, so you go searching for it. One of the character says out loud, hey, what are you doing? Uh, we need to go this way because we're trying to escape this dangerous emergency situation. And another character chimes in with like, oh, he's just searching all the corners for treasure. He does that a lot. Ah, that's silly. We've also got puzzles that are clearly just puzzles. They're just filler. A lot of this stuff makes no sense outside of a world where there's a guy walking around with a magical axe that can freeze things in place. Well, let's not even start on the climbing and the fucking ledges. These mechanics didn't complement the game. They were just there because, 
hey, that's how video games work, right? As games get more cinematic and serious, these game logic things just don't seem to fit. It can work in something cartoonish like Phoenix Immortal Rising, but recently Final Fantasy 16 director Naoki Yoshida correctly pointed out that as games get more realistic with their assets, things like old turn-based combat systems just look odd. I'm old and I love turn-based shit, but I hate to admit he's kind of right. It would look weird for these ultra photorealistic models to just be standing, waiting for their turn. There's this channel, Viva La Dirt League, and they do like videos about game logic and goofy game stuff. They have one, a skit about how weird it looks to wait your turn in combat. I'm gonna find that, I'm gonna link it. The combat in Ragnarok is also not really tight. They went for flashy, which is very, very cool looking, but after a while, the combat just kind of starts to feel a little stale. Now, there were a couple of fights where you would need to do something kind of tactical to win instead of just wailing on your enemy, but for the most part, the game's difficulty was delivered either through number of enemies or making them spongy, or both. Again, this is not strictly negative. The fights looked cool, you felt very powerful, but after several games of this kind of thing, it just doesn't feel very innovative, and with such beautiful landscapes to soak up and amazing stories to discover, the combat started to feel like kind of the weakest link. Overall, Ragnarok is a great game with a few... And you know what, I don't want to call them flaws. A few areas that didn't mature quite as well as the story. I would still highly recommend this game, and I did in a previous video. When it came to the Game of the Year award, though, I had no doubt Elden Ring would be taking it. This is a game that innovates and improves on almost every level. It is the perfected culmination of over a decade of Souls games. I'll talk about it after I make more tea. All right. Right out of the gate, I think it needs to be noted that FromSoft brought the most innovative solution to the easy mode debate in quite some time. Souls games are famous, or infamous, for their difficulty, which cannot be changed. Should games have difficulty modes? Every new Souls or Souls-like release drags up this argument. Personally, I'm on team difficulty modes, and I cannot believe that I have to do this, but I will post here all of my history and trophies and shit with the Souls game so I can prove to you that I'm not just some filthy casual that needs to get good. I love Souls games. I complete them multiple times, usually to 100%, unless there's some weird-ass grind, but I still see the need for flexibility for players. I'll make a whole video about this debate, but for the time being, the point is that Elden Ring, while it doesn't have strict difficulty modes, presents the player with more options than ever before to ease the difficulty. Due to its open-world nature, just poking around is going to reward you with weapons, spells, upgrade materials, new Ashes of War, which is a new mechanic they introduced to help with difficult fights, and just general experience to power up your character. I definitely wouldn't call this game easier, strictly, than previous Souls titles, but I would call it more flexible and more approachable than ever before. The completion numbers speak for themselves. Almost a year after its release, over a third of people who pick this game up on PlayStation, at least, make it all the way through. As far as open world games go, that is very much on the upper end of the completion spectrum. Souls games have always been described as tough but fair, and this is mostly due to the combat having been so finely tuned, even in the earliest games. This plays a little bit into the easy mode point, but it actually deserves its own section to talk about how this game is playable in any playstyle. They managed to make this big open world game that you can play any way you want. You can even choose which bosses you want to be. There are multiple routes to the end, and the map is like 80% open right from the start. There's no gatekeeping. All of this, and they managed to make a game that's fairly balanced. No one build is going to let you just coast all the way through, and you're never locked into one style. Compare this to another FromSoft title, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. I died way more than twice. In that game, Souls mastermind Miyazaki said, you play my way or no way. No armor upgrades, no different weapons, very slight character upgrades, a handful of tools with limited uses. You better fucking learn to parry or you're not getting past the first boss. Or take Dark Souls 2, where you were punished for dying even though the game never tells you how to not die. <laughs> That was probably the most opaque Souls game. Very little flexibility there. Elden Ring is the first Souls game to truly invite you to explore and learn without slapping you in the mouth when you do it wrong. My only real complaint is the respec system, which is locked behind a boss that is a few hours into the campaign, and you only get so many, you have to hunt down a material to do it. For a game that's wanting you to explore and experiment, it's kind of stingy with letting you change your build. 
Aside from that, Elden Ring really just hands you the keys and lets you play whatever way you want more than any other Souls game has. More than most games on the market, really. At the same time, though, it never really feels like they just threw you in the middle of the ocean and said, okay, swim, and left. Part of the reason the game is so flexible is owed to its excellent use of open world design, which not every game has or needs. FromSoft, however, didn't just make open world Dark Souls. They gave you the freedom to explore and a map that is just enough to keep you from getting completely lost. They didn't go the Ubisoft route of having a HUD cluttered with dozens of markers and symbols and flashing crap everywhere. The layout is clean and that adds to the invitation to explore and discover. You get a general hint of a direction to go via the golden light that comes out of some of the rest points. The world is also just big enough. Enemy groups and locations aren't right on top of each other, but they're also not spread out just so the developers could brag about the size of the world. 16 times the detail. I recently tried the demo for that Forspoken game everybody's shitting on, and it definitely falls into the too big trap. It was just open terrain with rocks and nothing interesting. I like that boulder. That is a nice boulder. It honestly looked like somebody was just playing around with the, the engine and then they were making landscapes and they had assets for buildings and they were like, I'll just stick one here and uh, one would go on this cliff for no fucking reason. Elden Ring delivered zones that were just dense enough and they had a unique feeling that separated them from each other and they delivered enough things to do without feeling overcrowded. Again, this is the cream of their crop of games. The last thing FromSoft iterated on was their story. Now, this is the part where I kind of have to admit that I have a bias. I already told you I've played all the Souls titles multiple times, and I've also watched a whole lot of Vati explain the story of the games and the unique way that FromSoft tells those stories. While playing, I felt like I had a solid grasp of Elden Ring's story, which is relatively new for me with Souls games. In addition to their difficulty, Souls games are kind of infamous for telling bits of a story and then allowing you to infer the rest of it through item descriptions or where items are placed in the world. I finished the game and, as usual, I watched Vati tell me what the story was, and it was weird because I already kind of knew most of it. I want to say that Miyazaki learned how to make his stories just heavily translucent instead of purely opaque. I will allow for the possibility that maybe I have just become accustomed to the way that he tells stories, kind of like a parent that understands what their toddler says, but everybody else just hears gibberish. Whatever the case, I usually enjoy the combat and the feeling of, you know, conquering a Souls game, but this game added depth because I was actually following the stories as I went. In every aspect, Elden Ring has improved what works and discarded what hasn't worked. It is lovingly crafted excellence, born from years of honing one genre. God of War was a fabulous game. It just wasn't on the same level of Elden Ring in any way, except for its outstanding writing and voice acting. In the end, I'm not sure how there ever was or still is a debate. Elden Ring was far and away the best game of 2022. Let me know your thoughts on the matter and your predictions for this year's crop of games. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Mm, boy, boy. Oh, I gotta take advantage of the scratchy voice. Honey, do you wanna get turned on?